Hello, so today we're going to take a look at our next text, which is called Disabled. This is a text written by Wilfred Owen, and it's a poem that examines uh, about the war and sort of the pity of war, okay, and the casualties and the suffering of war, everything that goes with it. Now, before we begin, um, just as a friendly, again, friendly reminder, make sure you open the worksheet and complete it as we uh, go along. Okay. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. Now, in terms of our structure today, we're going to start with by analyzing a little bit about the, the, the context, a little bit about the background, uh, and then we're going to look at the poem in terms of the writer's use of language and kind of explain some of the meanings. And then finally, at the very end, we're going to go back and look at the poem in terms of the writer's uses of structure. Okay. So without further ado, let's begin. Now, um, as you can kind of surmise from the, the background picture, the poem is about uh, disabled people, and in particular, disabled war veterans. Now, why is it that the, our poet chose this, uh, this topic in particular? Well, it's a topic that's particularly relevant to him, right? Uh, our poem, uh, sorry, our poet, his name is Wilfred Owen. He was an English soldier and a poet, uh, so he picked up both the pen and the sword, right? And he's written a number of very famous World War One poetry, including Dolce de Coromes, Insensibility, Anthem for a Doomed Youth, etc., uh, etc. Et so he wrote this uh, during his time serving in World War One. Okay, and um, <clears throat> he wrote many of them. Sadly, until his death, right, he was unfortunately killed in battle uh, about a week before Armistice Day. So um, a week before peace was kind of finally uh, settled. So quite a tragic ending uh, for our poet. Um, but as you can kind of surmise, um, a lot of this, his, his, war, uh, his poems based on war is especially relevant to him because being the fact that he is a soldier and he took part in the war himself. Now as for the setting of this poem, uh, it takes place in a veterans hospital um, and that's where a lot of the uh, present, quote unquote present, takes place. So in the present state, uh, he either our persona, our character, is in a, in a, war, in a hospital, right, uh, healing, mending from his wounds. But it also makes a brief mention of a park outside the hospital, as well as uh, a town. Now, this town is when the persona or character, prior to joining the war, it makes a reference to a few times in the past when he was in the, in the town, okay, in the city he lived in. So, post, so post-war, he's in the hospital, pre-war, uh, is his town. As for our characters, there's a few, there's one really, really one main character in this text, and that is our unnamed soldier. Now, for me personally, I feel like there are, our persona purposely chose uh, to not give a name to our soldier, right? Mainly because um, throughout history, there has been, you know, obviously millions and millions of soldiers who fought and died and, and, and kind of sacrificed um, on the battlefield. But yet, for many of the public, we don't often know their names. And the fact that their persona left this soldier without a name means that it could really be, you know, representing of any soldier, right? It could be representative of all the soldiers out there, you know, who have, you know, sacrificed and given their lives, um, you know, to defend their, their country and so on and so forth. So the fact that it's unnamed means that it could really literally be, you know, any one, you know, any, any, any soldier rather than a particular one. Now, the other two characters are fairly minor, right, and they really serve two purposes. Um, the first minor character we'll see are, is the, the, the poem makes a very brief mention about Giddy, Jilts, and Meg. They both serve the same purpose here, uh, and that is these, uh, Giddy, Jilts basically means a very kind of ditzy girl, a very superficial girl who you know, loves, you know, loves to chase after boys and whatnot, chase after guys. Uh, the purpose of both Megan Jilt and the Giddy Jilts here is really to highlight the sort of the, the shallowness, the naivety of our persona, of our unnamed soldier. Because, well, as we'll come to find out, right, he joins the war primarily to impress the girls. So that's his reason, or one of his main reasons. And obviously, that's a very superficial reason, and it costs him very, very dearly. The other minor character we'll see here are the nurses, and their purpose is to really illustrate the what happens to our persona as a result of his decision to join the war, right? Because of his decision, right, it ends up being that um, these nurses, right, these these females, right, they end up shunning him, right? And because of joining the war, he loses his limbs, he becomes some uh, somewhat of a, uh, of a scary figure, right? And so the nurses, they sort of 
touch him with a disgust. Right? They're they they're afraid of him, right? Which is quite sad because uh, though our persona is very shallow, right? Um, he still craves for the attention and love and warmth that um, the girls and females give him, and that's something that, as we come see with the nurses, something that he will uh, never ever uh, again experience um, because of his um, decision to join the war. Now, uh, one quick mention I do want to mention uh, quickly state here is that. In terms of the this poem, right? Um, one of the things that makes it a little bit different compared to the portrayal of war in other mediums is that, in oftentimes, right, when we see war portrayed in movies and films, right? Oftentimes, war is sensationalized. It's glamorized. It's made to, uh, you know, celebrate the heroism of particular figures and you know their sacrifices and achievements on the battlefield, etc., etc. Right? So it, it sort of glorifies war in in many ways. However, in this poem, um, it's a little bit different because this poem explores more about the the after effects, right? The um, the sort of the consequences of of war, and this aspect of, of it is is far darker. Um, as we now know, right? Um, you know, pe soldiers who participate in war suffer a variety of of physical and mental ailments, right? From everything ranging from PTSD, or back then what was called shell shock, to both physical and mental trauma, right? Such as losing limbs, or you know coming up, you know, coming back, and you know committing suicides and whatnot. So the end result is that many, many soldiers and war veterans who come back from battle are often left scarred. Right? And unfortunately, um, as we come to realize in this poem, a lot of these scarred veterans, well, society tends to kind of ignore their presence, right? There's not a lot of attention given to soldiers who come back from war compared to you know soldiers who are going to war or in war okay so uh, there's a lot of uh, um, i guess raising awareness that could be improved um, that's not really shown here now as for the next uh, part here we're going to start by looking at the actual poem um, here so the first one the poem starts with a very sort of depressed tone, right? He sat in a wheelchair waiting for dark. Now this sort of passes... It, now the key word here I want us to look, look at here is a sort of particular diction, sat, wheeled, and waiting. These are very passive diction. And it really goes to illustrate here that our persona is a very passive man now, right? He's not really active in doing his, his actions, right? he's not going around in a wheelchair, rather he's, he's, he's sitting there, right? in a chair that's wheeled by others and he's waiting for darkness to come. Okay, so there's this sort of um, automatically the sort of a sense of passivity um, we see right away. And the next line says he shivered in his ghastly suit of gray. Here the key word the key technique here I want us to focus on is on the alliteration of the G sound, right? The ghastly suit of gray, right? The, the g sound, right? Now this alliteration here uh, is really to emphasize this suit of gray, right? This ghastly suit of gray. First of all, what is ghastly? Ghastly is anything that something causes great horror or fear. And so this suit of gray he's wearing is scaring others, right? And it's creating this, this sense of fear, this aura of fear around him. But what is this suit of gray? Well, in this case, this is more metaphorical. He's not literally wearing a, a gray suit, but rather it's more about the the feeling of, of more like a gray cloud, right? This gray cloud or gray suit is more metaphorical for this feeling of sadness and depression that's surrounding him. Another thing to also want to make note here is the word shivered, right? Shivered, this this action of shaking, you know, when oftentimes when you're cold, is something that we'll we'll take a look at again at, at the very end of the text. Um, but the point being here. Uh, is that the shivering, right, is, is important because the shivering here highlights the fact that perhaps he's more alone, right? There's, there's no one around him, therefore he feels lonely, cold, and alone. It makes him shiver. Also note here that all of this diction here makes us feel, you know, that he's, our character is, is quite weak, and we see why. Because in the next line, it tells us he's legless, sewn short at elbows. So it's very blunt and direct. Tells us that our character, our soldier here, he is a disabled. He's almost quadriplegic, right? He's got no legs. Uh, you know, his, his, he's missing his his forearms, uh, and so he's you know a, a disabled person. This also kind of illustrates here the sort of the the physical. Uh, sacrifices he's made, right? He's given up many parts of his limbs um, to fight in a war. 
Now the next one here uh, really illustrates a sense of pity for our uh, persona, our character. Through the park, voices of boys rang sounding like a hymn. Now here, the park is a window outside, or what we surmise is a window outside his room. And as he looks out, he sees that there's a park. And the voices of boys rang sounding like a hymn. The voices of boys basically means through that through the nearby park, you can hear the little kids playing around. Now the thing is, oftentimes when you hear kids playing around, right, uh, you, know, you know, screams of happiness and joy, you know, it's it's supposed to be more upbeat. But for our for our character, for our soldier, right, it's sounding like a hymn. The simile here, sounding like a hymn, really illustrates the um, the feeling of sort of regrets, right, that our character experiences. Right? He feels sad when he hears the voices of those little boys, you know, playing around. Why? Because it's a reminder of everything he's lost. Because here, the kids outside are being active, they're running around, you know, they're playing around, but it's something that our, our character can never ever do, because obviously here, you know, he's, he's, because of his physical disabilities, he can never run around, you know, scream, you know, excitedly, just like these kids. So, the fact that, you know, he hears them, right, makes him feel sad, okay, uh, about it, because it's a reminder of what he's lost. And it goes on, right? Voices of play and pleasure after day. So it's something that he hears day after day. Okay, he hears the, the kids playing around, you know, being happy, you know, day after day. So he's constantly the reminder of everything he's lost. And he wait and he hears that sound all the way until gathering sleep had mothered them from him. So in other words, he sits there waiting, listens to these happy kid sounds, right? The kids boys playing until he feels sleepy and he's mothered to sleep. The key word here I want to take a look at here is the word mothered. The word mothered gives this sort of, in terms of the diction, right, reminds us of uh, of, our, of our own mothers, right? When we were a little bit uh, baby or a kid, right, uh, when we would need uh, a mother to, to kind of rock us to sleep. And so the, the, the poet here makes a concerted effort here to use this diction here to highlight the fact that our, our soldier now is almost childlike in the sense that he has to rely on those around him to mother him to sleep as if he's a baby, right? And so, again, which shows to highlight that sense of pity, the fact that he's cannot do anything, he's relying completely on others, uh, and that, the fact that he's, you know, acting no more than a baby now, creates a very strong sense of pity because this is supposed to be a young man. One other thing to make note here is do men make mental note of the word mother? This is something that will come back and sleep, or something that will come back at the very end of the text. Also, make a note here as well. In the so far in the first stanza here, uh, everything here mentioned is all about the present for the character. Now, in the next stanza here, however, from here on, from this part, second stanza, we're gonna start switching back and forth between the past and the present. Okay, so up to this point, everything is in the present. Our soldier is uh, obviously disabled; he's disfigured, he's sitting in the hospital. But now, in the second stanza, we now switch. We have almost like a flashback to his past. And here, uh, it recalls his past about a time when before he joined the war. And before he joined the war in his town, or where our character lived, the town used to swing so gay, meaning the town was filled with happiness and joy, which is obviously a contrast to his present state. And he further elaborates on the past, right? He mentions here the glow lamps budded. So you can kind of see from this, this painting in the back, right? The glow lamps, so there's the glow lamps gives us this, this, this glowing of lights. And also, the light blue trees, right? The trees themselves gives us this, this light bluish color, which overall creates this sort of romantic feeling. And this sort of romance is further highlighted by the usage of the alliteration in the next line, right? Girls glance lovelier as the air grew dim. The alliteration of the G sound here really sort of uh, emphasizes that sense of romance uh, that he had when he's thinking about his own past. And this line basically means, you know, at the time, you know, when he thinks back, the town used to be so happy, you know, it was very full of romantic setting, and the girls, as the night grew darker, the girls he looked at, they looked even more, you know, they looked more lovely, they looked more pretty, you know, as darkness falls. So, all of this contributes to this feeling that his past was sort of full of uh, fun and love and, and romance. But of course, the poem then, the poet then switches back to the present, right? and mentions that, but this was all in the past, in the old times, before he threw away his knees. So before his accident 
uh, before his uh, no accident, but before the war took away his limbs, right? This was all of these. This, this sense of romance was everything that happened before. The key word here I also want to look at here is the word is the th word threw away. Notice here that this diction is is quite active, meaning he's. It's almost as if he's doing it as if he he, he himself right ch uh, threw or tossed away his limbs, which of course sounds kind of odd, right? You know, why would one choose to throw away your knees? Well, think about it this way, right? Instead of saying, you know, before his knees were taken away, i.e. someone else was responsible, here, by saying he threw away his knees, puts the onus of responsibility on our character, as if he had done something that caused him to lose his own legs, okay? So it wasn't the fault of someone else's, but rather his fault. And we'll see in the poem later on, it will explain this one a little bit, uh, why it is this. And then it says here, now he will never feel again how slim girls' ways are. So here, it sends, gives that sense, again, highlights this sense, this tone of regret, uh, loss, right? Saying that he will never ever feel slim the girl's waist are, i.e. put his hands around the girl's waist, although, i.e. basically meaning he will never again feel the love uh, of a girl. Okay, he will never be able to have the chance to put his arms around a girl's waist, uh, both physically because he's incapable, but perhaps also uh, the, you know, they, they, the girls will never allow him to do so. They'll never fall in love with him. Right? And he'll never feel how warm their subtle hands. Okay, so the softness, this warmness, you know, this warmth is, is important because here, right, he'll never feel the warmth and love of love, right? Rather, he was uh, forever destined to um, suffer from the coldness of being uh, lonely. All of them touch him like some queer disease. All of them, them meaning the girls, okay, the females. Now, do remember here for our character, um, the role of the females here acts uh, is very, very important to him because everything he does, or most of the things he does, is centered around the idea of girls. Okay, so it's, for him, it's very, 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 very important to him. But the thing is, now, right, all of these females that he values so much, well, they touch him like some queer disease, i.e. Notice here the simile, right? They they touch him like he's some sort of illness, like he's sort of got some transmittable disease. So they 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 don't dare touch him like he's something of an of an alien figure, like or or not alien figure, but as if he's infected by something highly contagious, right? So as you can see here, right, the the, the people, the females here, they all shun him now, right? They, they treat him as if he's got some terrible disease and stay far, far, far away from him, which is quite sad because again, this is um, something that is very important to our character, right? The, the presence of being close and loved by females. And then he flips back, however, to a, a time in the past. And here it mentions, there was an artist silly for his face. So here, now he recalls another flashback, where at a time in the past before he joined the war, well, our, our character, he, remind, he, rem, he remembered a time when there was an artist who admired his handsome looks. For it was younger than his youth last year. So here it's saying that you know his his face was very very young, full of life, full of vitality, full of energy, right? And um, so and this was only a year ago, right? Before he joined the war. This is important because here it contrasts. It creates a contrast with the following line here when it says, "Now he is old, his back will never break." Right. So here you see the contrast between him before the war. He was handsome. He was youthful, full of energy. But now after the war, he is now old. Right. He he can't even stand up straight. He can never brace. He can stand up, be a man. Right. He's no longer. Um, uh, a man figure, rather, he's just uh, reduced to uh, a disabled someone who's almost childlike now. He's lost his color very far from here. This line tells explains us why his back will never raise, why he looks old. It's very simple here. The metaphor here, the color, is a reference to blood. Okay, uh, if you want to expand, you can mention his sort of his vitality, his energy, his energy, his life. But the key point here is that he's lost a lot of his blood. He lost a lot of a uh, loss, a big part of him uh, physically in a place very far from here. Where is that place? Well, very straight foot, straight foot forward, it's in the battlefields, okay, in World War One, Where in the shell holes, shell holes is another word for craters, right, the, the, the holes made from large artillery shells, right, well, he poured it down shells till the veins ran dry. Now notice here again, poured it down shelled holes. Again, there's a sort of active diction here, seeming to put the responsibility of losing all that blood 
on Owen's own uh, choices, right? It's because of himself that he ended up losing so much blood. So here, again, the responsibility of Onus is placed on him. Right? And all of he can is he lost a lot of blood till the veins ran dry even. So we can see to the extent of the blood loss, of the injury, the suffering, right, the, the, the graphic punishment that he received uh, because of his decision to join the war. And as a result of all this blood loss, right, half his lifetime lapsed in the hot race. The keyword here, lapsed in hot race, right, um, is basically again a, a more of an uh, almost like an extended metaphor for basically saying his life. Okay, so uh, you know, his lifespan. Okay, so if he, for, so face, say for example, if he was destined to live, say originally, right, maybe he was supposed to live till he was 80. Well, now his life is cut in half, right? His life is cut in half. He's going to die at 40. So the hot race is again as a metaphor for uh, the, the war. Okay, so the the, com the competitive aspect of, of war is compared to like the competitive as aspect of a race, right? The the race for first, the race for uh, the fighting for survival. Okay. And then the graphic imagery kind of build, builds on, right? A leap of purple spurted from his thigh. Right? So again, there's a very graphic imagery of the, the sense of the, the the loss he had, right? Physically this time. Of the immense amount of blood, the purple here is, is basically a reference for dark, dark, dark color of blood, dark blood color. So obviously here he suffered a very serious injury. One time, now here, however, though he mentions that all of his present loss, right, does he does, however, remember of a time when he was injured, when he had a blood loss in the past. And here, when he recalls it, he says, one time he liked a blood smear down on his leg. Now, this is somewhat ironic, because in the present state, right, he's lost all this sort of blood, he's lost it, you know, in the, in the hot rays, so I poured it down shell holes, right, it's made him feel depressed. But, it's sort of ironic, because in the past, right, there was once a time when he lost blood, when he lost blood, he didn't feel depressed, rather, he liked that feeling. Why is that? How can we explain it? Well, in order to understand it, you have to kind of understand the mentality, the mindset of sort of this, this masculine society, um, or sort of this masculine um, concept that he, he, he believed in, right? And that is, as you can see from these gifs, right? Oftentimes in sort of society, right, when we see a, a male figure fight through injury and fight through pain, we portray that person as a very manly uh, figure, someone who's very, very, very tough, right? And that's something to uh, be proud of or, or uh, in, in society, at least, at least among sort of male figures, right? Your ability to withstand pain and, and suffering uh, and still succeed is a sort of a, a, an honor almost. And then he recalls, right, his past, when, and he compares it to his sporting achievements, right? After matches carried shoulders high. So he remembers about the time in the past. And in the past, the, our, our character lived a much more happier life, right? Here, he played in football matches, right, where he was carried shoulder high. So he was celebrated, you know, for his injury, okay? And it was after the match, right, when he drunk a peg. So here he says, after those matches, right, he was celebrated, right, he was, the people, they were all happy, right, they went to the pub, they had a drink. And it was after a drink, however, that he made the biggest mistake of his life. When he says, he thought he'd better join, he wonders why. When he says, after drinking the alcohol, right, and he's a little bit drunk, when he's a little bit tipsy, right, he thinks he'd better join. What is he joining? He's joining, in this case, the army. Now notice here the the structure here. This is something we'll, we'll this is an example of a caesura, which is something we'll come back at the very end. Um, but note here that when he says he thought he'd better join, so at the time he's thinking, okay, I should join the army. When he's a little bit drunk, and as we know, that's probably not the best time to make a life-altering decision, right? When you're sort of inebriated, right? And here he questions why now. So we see here that there is a sort of a disconnect, a dissonance between the past him and the present. Him. The past him thought after drinking beer, I should join the army. The present him, however, wonders why. He's questioning his decision to join the war, which all of this creates an obvious sense of this tone of regret. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts. Now here we get the one of the one of the first reasons why he joined the war. And we see that in this case here, it's because he's quite superficial. Right, he says here he thinks that he'd look like a god in kilts. There's a metaphor here, right? Um, and it's basically saying you know he'd look really, really handsome if he wore a kilt, uh, or if he wore a kilt. 
Um, now, kilts, one thing I do want to point out about kilts is that kilts traditionally are ceremonial. They're not really meant for battle. Okay, so there's something you wear when you want to uh, kind of build the, the ceremony, make a, make a pu you know, public appearance, but they're not for battle. So we can already see that in his mind, right? He's not thinking about fighting, he's thinking about looking handsome which kind of shows his sort of very naive, his naive mindset, but also his sort of very superficial mindset, right? He's both naive and foolish and thinking, you know, joining a war, he won't have to fight, especially during World War One. And also he was thinking more about, you know, looking handsome. And the next line kind of builds upon that, right? And that's why maybe too, to please his Meg. So here he says that, basically admits that, you know, aside from looking handsome, perhaps another reason is that he wanted to impress his Meg, his girlfriend, right? He wanted to think, you know, make her feel impressed that you know, her boyfriend is, is a soldier, right? Which, again, is very super, is a very superficial reason for, for joining uh, the war. Um, and it really goes to show again that the fact that he's not really thought out very clearly of his decision. Okay, because here the only thing that's important here is impressing the girls, which in the grand scheme of things ended up costing his legs and definitely not worth it. Aye, that was it to please the giddy jilts. Giddy jilts again we mentioned before are the girls who are also quite superficial, looking for you know boys to fool around with. And in this case here, and he admits it, right? Our, our character here, him, he himself is also just as superficial, right? He just wanted to not only impress his girls, his girlfriend, but also to impress the other girls around him, right? He wants them to think that, oh my, you know, he's he's so handsome, you know, he's so manly, you know, he's a soldier, etc., etc. The next line says he has to join. He didn't have to beg. So here we see that. We see one of the reasons why our persona had that sense of regret earlier, because here, now we find out that he wasn't drafted, he wasn't forced to join the war, rather, he voluntarily did it himself. And this really illustrates the fact that, um, you know, his decision ended up costing him dearly, right? And it was a decision that he made while inebriated, while drunk, and while he was n naive enough uh, to feel like he, that was a, a good decision. And so this is quite a, a, an important development because it tells us here that, you know, he asked for, he, he asked for all this, right? All of this could squarely put the blame on, on himself, right? The fact that he suffered all this is something that he did to himself. Smiling, they wrote as lie, age 19 years. Now this line kind of creates also a sense of, um, a little bit of pity, uh, a little bit of pity, but also a sense of anger, because here we find out that when the they who are who are, who are they, they are the army recruiters. We find out that they knew he was underage, meaning he wasn't old enough to enter the war even actually. But still, they wrote down his name, and they wrote down his lie, right, his claim to be nineteen when he clearly wasn't, and so they shipped him off to war. And this creates a very strong sense of pity because here we find out that this this youth, this young you know, teenager, right, who hadn't really experienced life, right, you know, who could have received some guidance and help from others, but didn't get receive any, you know, ended up making the biggest mistake of his life, and there was really no one there to to help him. Okay, and rather than even help him, there were people who, who wanted to take advantage of him. Right, they they wrote down his lie, right, you know, they let him participate in the war, which ended up causing him to basically lose out. You know, the rest of his life, or half of his life. And then we find out his, his rationale. <coughs> now, his rationale for joining the war, even more in detail. The next line here says that Germans, he scarcely thought of all their guilt. Germans, why is there a particular mention of Germans? Well, Germans are one of the aggressors in World War One, together with the next line here, and Austria. So, here, what, this line is also important because it tells us, really, uh, his motivation, right? So, here, our character, right? He didn't think, scarcely thought, he didn't think much of the Germans or the Austrians, right? It did not move him, right? I.e., in other words, it, by thinking of them, it did, they didn't, he didn't really even think about fighting the Germans and Austrians, right? For him, there was no fears of fear came yet. He was unafraid, right, basically, of the fear, which is capitalized here, right? And why is this capitalized? Because the fear here is something that basically means the fear of war, right? So, uh, you know, the the, pot the possibility of death, being dismembered, right? Uh, you know, all sorts of those things, right? He wasn't, he didn't know to be afraid, and that is very powerful because it really goes to show his sort of naivety. Because he doesn't joining war, he never really considered the the potential consequences of war. 
Instead, what did he think about? Well, he thought of very, very superficial elements. He thought about jeweled hilts. A hilt is the handle of a sword. So if you imagine the sword, right, having jewels engraved into it, right, you would think, oh wow, that's a fancy sword. However, however, this is the thing that the type that inspired our persona to join the war, right? He wasn't thinking about fighting and defending his country against the Germans and Austrians, no. He was thinking about carrying a diamond encrusted sword. One other thing I want to point out here is that jeweled hilts, especially the, the ones like this, right, are typically more ceremonial rather than practical. So in the battlefield, you don't often see soldiers carrying jeweled uh, weapons, rather, these are only uh, things you would wear on a more of a ceremonial role. So soldiers who are doing ceremonies may carry fancy weapons like these to show off to the public, but in a real battle they wouldn't carry that this type of weapon. And again, this shows really goes to show uh, how little the, the the character had thought of thought of his decision right when he made this choice to join the army, right? Because here, all he's thinking about is, is about the glamour and the glitz of war rather than the potential risks involved. The next one kind of builds onto that, right? It says daggers and plate socks of smart salutes. So here, the the sibilance of the S sound, right, really illustrates here again what is he, our persona a, uh, after? He's wanting, he wants to salute, right? He wants to do the act of saluting to his fellow soldiers, right? He wants to wear plate socks. He wants to hide daggers inside, like he's a secret agent, right? He wants to do all of these fancy, glamorous things of a soldier, right? But he doesn't quite yet realize what the reality of life is, right? Not to mention here, the use of listing here, care of arms and leave and pay arrears, right? Basically care of arms meaning the brotherhood, right? And leave, so he wants, he's, he's looking for, you know, you know, uh, working together with his fellow, you know, you know, soldier brothers, soldier brethren, right? He's looking for a sick leave, day leave, he's looking for holidays, he's looking for payment, he's looking for salary and money. These are his motivation for joining the war, right? He's look, not because he wants to defend one's country, rather, he's wanting his holidays, he wants money, right? He wants esprit de corps. What does that mean? Esprit de corps is uh, a brotherhood, right? A, a feeling of pride and loyalty between a few members. He wants to feel like he's part of a brotherhood, right? And he wants, he's thinking about providing hints for young recruits. So he's not thinking about participating in war himself. He's thinking of just giving generalized tips to, to other young soldiers beneath him. So as you, one of the things you notice, notice is consistent is that throughout all of this imagination of being a soldier, there is zero mention of fighting. So as you can kind of in, uh, you know, break down from this is that he clearly, clearly hasn't thought about fighting in the war. Rather, he's only interested in being a soldier because of sort of the benefits that surrounds being a soldier, right? Being able to wear fancy socks, salutes, carrying jeweled, you know, expensive swords, making money, having holidays, right? And feeling he's part of a brotherhood. Well, all of these, you know, do exist in some form, but that's not really necessarily the, the, the main reason. Um, one should think about when they're joining to fight in World War One, right? And then the next line tells us that soon enough after he joined, well, he was drafted out with drums and tears. Notice here that the send-off that they they received was quite impressive. There were people playing drums, right? There was loud cheering from the crowd, so they, they, they went to war with a very positive reception. This contrasts, however, to the next line where he says when he returns home, well, there's only some cheered him home. So, not everybody, just a few, just some people cheered, right? But the cheering wasn't even as strong or powerful or as impactful as when the crowds cheer goal. The goal here is capitalized again to emphasize just how sort of kind of ridiculous this is, right? That fact that people celebrate kicking a ball in the net more so and louder and more frequently with more fervor compared to soldiers coming home after having sacrificed almost all their uh, extremities, right? All, all those limbs. So this line really goes to show, uh, again, the sort of, in a way, a critique of, of society, of, of our own hypocrisy, of how we celebrate sporting achievements more than, you know, the, the veterans who's given up, you know, their, their, their very lives, in many cases, you know, for us to enjoy our, our, our current sort of um, lifestyle. And the next line here stands out, really goes to so the next line here, really illustrates here the, the how little of an appreciation he got, right? Only a single solemn man brought him a few fruits, okay? Only one person came to see him, right? And the one person thanked him, it's italicized, it's italicized really to illustrate the, 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 the lack of thanks, right? There's only one. 
and then inquired about his soul. Now this here, the word soul is important because this soul here cares a little bit of, about a spiritual addiction, right? And it's important because it really illustrates here that the soldier didn't just suffer physical ailments and physical disabilities, but rather he also suffered mental disabilities, right? In this case, or spiritual, right? Uh, something because of the war, the experiences, because it's so haunting and powerful, right? It's really impacted his soul. So it goes to see that the impact of war affects a soldier completely holistically. And then the, the poem soon ends uh, on this very really pitiful note. Now he will spend a few sick years in institutes. So, i.e., he's no longer going to um, be active. He's going to spend his remaining time lying in a, in a sick bed in, a, in, a, in an institute, in, in, a, in a hospital, right? His remaining time is going to be bedridden, you know, stuck in a hospital in a few sick years. Notice the diction sick, right? Conveys this idea of almost like an illness, right? as if. Um, our, our character himself is, is has some disease, but of course we know that's not true. Our person doesn't have a disease; he's just simply disabled. And yet society treats him like he has some illness, um, and we all shun him and ignore him, which of course creates a very powerful sense of pity. Right? We feel sorry for these soldiers who are alone and desperate and. Will, won't have anyone beside them to give them and share them any warmth and love, okay, and attention. And so our persona will do what things the rules consider wise. It's just another way of saying our, our persona will become a very passive person now, right? He will no longer chase after girls, rather, he will wait every sit up and wait every day, listen to the boy singing until he sleeps. So he's now switching to a very passive, boring lifestyle, which of course makes us feel pity. And take whatever pity they may do. They, again, meaning females, right? So here, he will accept their pity, right? He will accept their feel females feeling pity. Um, um, just because this is what he can receive, right? He can no longer have, uh, you know, chase after girls, any little tidbit of attention, right? Any little pity. Uh, he will still receive. And this is, uh, again, very pitiful and very, very, very sad. Because generally speaking, we, uh, as humans, we don't really generally want you know, others to pity us, right? You know, we don't want really care whether others feel sorry for us. Um, but in this case here, for our, our, our character, he has no choice because this is the only thing he has left, right? When people feel sorry for him, right? And it's quite sad because you would imagine, right, uh, you know, instead of feeling pity for the, you know, for him being disabled, right? Society should be more celebratory. Right? We should celebrate and, and and recognize, right, that these men have given up, you know, the sacrifice so much, right, for the rest of us, so that we don't have to participate in war, you know, that we, so we can live, uh, you know, safely, or safety, right? We shouldn't pity these people. We should, you know, do the reverse. We should celebrate them, make them feel proud and happy. But alas, you know, that's not to be, and all he, he can get is just pity. And then he mentions tonight he noticed how the woman's eyes passed from him to the strong men that were whole. So notice here that the, 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 you know, the, the affection of the woman that he craves so much now is something that he will no longer have. Right? The girls will not look at him at, anymore. Rather, who will they look at? They will look at the men who were whole, i.e. men... <coughs> Men who don't have any disabilities, men who have all both arms, both legs, you know, you look at men who are whole. And that's quite sad because, um, you know, this soldier sacrificed everything, right, in the hopes of impressing the woman. But now these women will, they will never look at him again. They will only um, look at men who have all their legs and arms. How cold and late it is, why don't they come? Now, next one, this last uh, line here, right? Notice here, it uses an exclamation mark. It's really to illustrate, to emphasize here, the cold and the lateness, right? The cold I wanted to draw attention here is because, again, this coldness reminds us of this feeling of, this tone of isolation, this tone of, of being abandoned, right? Of being alone, right? There's no warmth of another person with him, okay? Now, the, it ends on a very pitiful tone. And this pillow of the tone is conveyed through the repetition, why don't they come and put him into bed? Why don't they come? The why don't they come here, right, is extremely, is, 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 is a use of repetition, and it creates this sort of tone of almost begging, like like a child begging for, um, 
you know, uh, for, for, for something. And it's really, really sad because here he's begging, you know, for, for the females um, to, to put him to sleep, right? And it's something that he won't ever receive because their attention now is on others, right? They, no one, no female will ever look at him the same, okay? Um, as compared to his past. They only feel he's disgusting and they only pay attention to others. And so it really illustrates that he's lost everything he's, he's sort of prioritized in his life. Okay? And so that ends our part. Alright, and now for our next part here, we're going to finish off by looking at the usage of structure. And I'll try to make this part quick, um, but let's start with the um, where we left off here, which is in the last stanza. Now, for this part here, you know, if you remember, right, uh, the the text ends by mentioning how uh, it puts him to sleep, right? Uh, how cold and late is? Why don't they come and put him into bed? So this here, the the writer actually book ends uh, with the first stanza. So it ends and begins with both a reference to sleep, to gathering sleep and mother then from him, also and put him into bed. So uh, in other words, the the poem creates a very nice, almost like a a cyclical, a circular structure, right? It starts and begins, starts and ends um, with um, the desire to be put to bed. Next up, we're going to take a look at here is the sixth stanza, which is lines 37 to 39. This one is uh, particularly important because uh, in this case here, you'll notice that this is the shortest stanza in the entire poem. Um, and it's a short stanza for a particular reason. The reason being is that this stanza is focusing on the appreciation, or in this case here, the lack of appreciation uh, the soldier received. So notice here that he only had a solemn man brought him fruits and thanked him. So there's only one person who came in to thank him, right? And this lack of appreciation uh, is reflected in this short stanza, which is the only stanza talking about the appreciation he had, and therefore very little appreciation from others. The next one we'll take a look at is the use of Zazura. Okay. Zazura is the pause or break in a line due to the rhythm of a speech. There's a few in particular I want to look at. Um, the first one I want to focus on is this one. Now, <clears throat> now he is old, his back will never brace. This one highlights the sort of the harsh consequences of his actions, right? Because of his, because of what he's done, right? Um, he's given up his youth, okay, and now he has become an old man. His back will never brace. So it's this is your right here. Kind of illustrates this sort of uh, feeling that he's bro his body is broken down, right? Just like kind of the, the pauses and the breaks. You know, he's become a broken shell of himself. The next one we'll take a look at here is this one. He thought he'd better join. He wonders why. This one you can see here. Uh, there's a very obvious Zura right here, uh, and this one is really to illustrate the sort of the moment of reflection the poet had, right? Or sorry, the the, the character had. At this moment, right, at the time he thought he'd better join the army, but now when he looks back, when he looks back in hindsight, he thinks, you know, why did he make such a decision? And so there's this tint of regret uh, at why, and where, where the character, even he himself didn't understand why he made such a choice. The next line is this one, and that's why maybe to uh, to please his Meg again. This is right here is to really again to illustrate the uh, the his lack of clarity on his answer. That he too he's there's a sort of hesitation that he's kind of unsure why he made such a decision himself, which kind of compounds that feeling of you know pity because you know even he didn't understand why he he made such a foolish decision that ended up costing him um, half his life. He has to join. He didn't have to beg. Is another one. This one here highlights again the sorts, the sense of um, the the irony of the situation, right? That the fact that he kind of puts this, uh, you know, he he did this decision based purely on his own uh, decision to to do it. I.e., he didn't really think things through, right? Uh, there, he didn't really think things through, and the fact that there was no one really there to help him, right? That. This his decision to join is his and his alone, right? He didn't have to beg. There was no one stopping him either. So this one goes to show that he didn't really have any guidance. No one really to help him, right? And he, and the worst part of all is that he made the mistake of joining uh, under his own decision to do so. Okay. 
Last one here is that uh, smiling, they wrote his lie, age 19 years. This one really illustrates his, um, in this case here, it really goes to show that the sort of sadness you feel, right? Because here, smiling, they wrote his lie, age 19 years. Well, the thing is, notice that the recruiters, right, these army recruiters, they themselves, right, were sort of kind of evilish, I guess you could say, kind of kind of uh, devious, deceptive, perhaps is a better word, and the fact that they knew he was underage, and yet they still wrote his lie, i.e. they knew he was underage, but they still wrote down he was 19 in any case, because for them, it didn't matter, they just needed someone there to fight, okay, so, and it's quite sad, because you know, oftentimes as a society, we're supposed to kind of protect and guide, you know, young adults, uh, sorry, young teenagers, you know, you know, um, you know, to help them make the best choices. But here we see that he didn't really receive the same, you know, guidance and care that society nowadays provides. Uh, at the time, they just took advantage of him, sent him off to war, and he ended up losing all of his legs. Uh, one last one here, as sure as this one, some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheer goal. This one, again, the pause here, is really used to illustrate the contrast, okay, between the appreciation you received. You see some cheering, but crowds cheer goal more. So, again, this one really goes to illustrate here how, despite making the bigger sacrifice, right, coming back as a quad, uh, using both, both his legs and arms, there was only a few cheers, but people still rather cheer when people score a goal. Okay, so again, it's sort of uh, kind of ridiculous um, that you know, people cheer goal more than the soldier coming back after the sacrifice they made, but you know, that's the, the poet's commentary here. Next one we'll talk about here is the use of enjambment. Enjambment is the continuation of lying. Um, and this one, there's one in particular I want to focus on, and it is this line in particular. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are. This one really illustrates or focuses on the fact that this uh, our persona uh, will never feel again. So the, the the extension of the line beyond this means that you know it's uh, it's not a temporary uh, denial, but rather it's a permanent. Uh, he will never feel again how slim the girl's ways are. So it's something that will go on and on until for the rest of his life. Okay, so he will never feel again. So this enjambment really highlights that sense of loss. Okay, that he will something that he will never ever have the opportunity uh, to to do so. Uh, the next one I'll talk about here is the usage of rhyme. Uh, now for rhyme is you'll notice that I've kind of circled some of the words here in particular, uh, but the key thing I want us to focus on here is that a it's got a fairly regular rhyme, okay, with occasional breaks. I uh, for example, for example, like the hymn here, right and dim, hymn and dim will rhyme. But the thing is, uh, the what I want to focus on here is that the regular rhyme. Notice how it extends beyond a single stanza. For example, the gray, the day, and the gay. Right, the, um, these three words here are. Gray and day are in the first stanza, gay is in the third, uh, second stanza. And similarly, trees, knees, second stanza, uh, disease, third stanza, right? Um, but you'll notice here that because here it extends beyond the stanza, right? So one of the things I want us to, to focus on here is how that perhaps the reason why it's done so is to create this impression that everything uh, in this character's life is, is sort of interlinked, intertwined, right? If you're familiar with the kind of the, the movie The Butterfly Effect or the theory of the butterfly effect, right? This could be extension of that. Here, the the poet, because of his decisions, right, that he made in the past, right, everything in the past is now linked to the present, right. Every every decision he's made has carried a consequence, a lead up and build up to his mistake, right. For for example, um, you know, because he, um, you know, because he, you know, he drank he he drank some alcohol, right. He decided to join the army, and because of that, he ended up losing his legs, uh, you know. And now he can no longer, you know, feel the the warmth and love of a female, right? So everything is is linked, uh, and it kind of builds onto one another, um, which is kind of highlighted by this usage of rhyme. Uh, one other thing I was mentioned though is structure is be aware of the time shift. I think I briefly mentioned this earlier, but 
uh, notice, do make a mental note here of where the poem has is taking place in the past and when it is taking place in the present. For example, the first stanza here is entirely in the present. This from lines uh, about 7 to 10 is in the past. Uh, 11 uh, to what, 13 is again back to the present, and etc. etc. So be aware of the constant shifts in, uh, in time. And last note, the last thing to note here is the, the ending. So I do want to state here that the poem ends with a very uh, powerful sense of helplessness and pity and the lack of hope. So it ends in a very, very depressed tone. Um, and we can see it because here we see how the persona, sort of, sort of the character, kind of bemoans the fact that he's sort of ignored, right? That he can only receive pity from others, right? He, he's stuck there waiting f uh, the last few years of his life in the hospital, basically waiting to die, right? And he's all this, all this while here, he noticed how the woman's their eyes, they no longer look at him, right? Which is something he valued a lot, but he doesn't, you know, no one gives it to him anymore. You know, the, the woman, they only look at other men who were whole. And all he, and now he is only confined to his bed where he's stuck begging. Uh, for someone to put him to sleep. So uh, it really emphasizes that sense of helplessness um, to conclude the poem and really kind of solidifies that tone of, uh, of pity. Okay, And that wraps up our breakdown of the structure. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to let me know. Uh, as for the actual the Word document, the worksheet, it's uh, all the information is posted there. Please note that you will need to submit the textual analysis as well as the, the reading question homework. Uh, the submission deadlines are already posted uh, on, school, on our class Schoology. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, good luck in your studies, and uh, well, until next time when we start our next video. So goodbye.